Okay. <laughs> Where are you? Me? Yes. En, en mi casa, que es tu casa. Okay. I wish I was there. I yes. wish you were. Bye. Bye. <laughs> I wish I I wish I was with either of you wherever. Either and both, preferably. When can we ever travel again? That's ah, it's driving me. Let's make a plan to all go see Diana together. <laughs> Maybe we need to drive. Drive. We can try. Okay. We can drive. Yeah. yeah who wants she to? is certainly self-isolating. So oh my goodness, she's so desperate. She is so desperate. Well, we could all go. Jump in the car and she does she no. doesn't believe in COVID. Every time I speak with her, she says, just come. I don't give a fuck about the virus. <laughs> It probably isn't even true. That's amazing. That's amazing. Uh, if we weren't in a in a plane, we you know in a car might be okay, right? Right. Yeah. That's right. what I yeah. think. I just I just think it's risky for me to now go because I've been interacting with people yeah, at the restaurant and right. I mean with distance and with you know all covered up, but it's I I would I. She's ninety seven. I know, I know. I you know. can't really, you can't really you take that risk. Walk. No, we'd, we'd have to go. We'd, we would have to. Uh, we, we would have I'm to go to at the hotel for a couple of weeks. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> that wouldn't be so bad. <laughs> what else have you got to do? <laughs> hmm. All right. I see we have some uh, some people already beginning to watch. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us uh, for this. Uh, Q&A to celebrate the virtual cinema release of the film, Diana Kennedy, Nothing Fancy. Um, if you have questions for the panelists, feel free to ask them in the Q&A box um, at the bottom of your screen. And uh, without further ado, I'll introduce our moderator, uh, Leslie Tellis. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for coming. I'm really excited and honored to be moderating this panel today. Um, we are all, all of us, um, just super excited to be here and to be talking about Diana Kennedy, who's somebody that we all admire and respect so much. Um, so I just want to kick it off um, because we, we don't have a ton of time for questions, so I want to just dig right in. Um, so the, the first question I had was for Elizabeth Carroll, the director of this documentary. Um, you know, Diana, as you'll see in the film, but um, even if you've read a little bit about Diana, she's, she's very no holds barred. She'll tell you immediately, you know, what she thinks. Um, and so I'm wondering, how did you convince her to say yes to this project, um, to have somebody follow her around with a camera uh, and sharing all of the details of her life? How did you convince her to say yes? And what was it like working with her? This project took a while. You told me that it took, I think, six over six years to get everything together. So um, how did she say yes? And what was it like uh, working with her across so many years? Yeah, so um, it, was, it was a journey. Um, <laughs> thanks everybody for being here. I'm Elizabeth. Um, this is really exciting and it's a pleasure to be here with all of you guys. Um, thanks for everybody who's watching and supporting the film. It's a really exciting moment for us and for Diana and everything else. So, um, yeah, so the way it started was kind of a serendipitous little whirlwind. Um, and I wanted to do a, a kind of different project, broader project about Mexico and women in Mexico specifically and how in a contemporary sense they were passing down recipes and food traditions and what that looked like. And, you know, I had my sights set on interviewing people like Gabriela specifically, you know, Mexican women who had a, you know, a stronghold on the contemporary food scene in Mexico. And so I was looking around for women to interview and I found Diana and I was like, oh, right. And I had barely heard of her because I think that my generation didn't get the sort of, you know, contextual introduction to Diana as a lot of other you know, people my my parents' age who were into cooking had always mm -hmm. heard of Diana, you know, and they had they were very familiar with her, especially in Texas or maybe in California. But um, you know, people my age had no idea who she was. 
for in large part, unless they went to culinary school, you know, mm -hmm. maybe learned about her there. But um, so when I found her, I was like, oh my God, this woman, she's 91. She lives in the woods in Michoacan, like, and she knows everything. She knows all of this stuff that I'm interested in, but she's British. She's not even Mexican, you know, and she's written all these cookbooks. I have to find her. She has to be part of this project. So I knew I wanted to meet her. I didn't know how to find her. I didn't know if she had an email address at all. And so I was kind of looking around on the internet for how to get in touch with her. And I didn't find anything that day. This is the end of 2013. And I was in this coffee shop and I kind of gave up on it. And I was like, oh, well, I'll, maybe I'll find it later. And then I left and then went to this bookstore in Austin called Book People. This is like 20 minutes later. And I looked at the marquee of the bookstore as I pulled in and it said, book signing with Diana Kennedy tomorrow. Wow. <laughs> and it was just like, that was the beginning of this bizarre cosmic thing that happened. So anyway, I ended up meeting her there and, and I had written an email to her publicist that the bookstore gave me that night. And I was like, hey, Diana, if you'd be willing to interview, brief interview, you know, no big deal, no pressure, but I would just love to have your input, you know, on these larger themes. Um, I didn't hear anything back. So I was like, oh, well, maybe she didn't get it. And then I went into the event the next day and I wore like my lucky scarf and I was like trying to <laughs> just put out the good vibes. And then I walked in and I looked to my right and Diana's walking in at the exact same time. And I walked up to her and I was like, hi, Diana, I'm Elizabeth. And she goes, oh yes, you're the woman who wants to make the film about me. <laughs> and I was like, uh, yeah, I mean, that, sure. That sounds good. I guess we could do that. That's interesting. So it was kind of like, Jokingly, I say it was her idea, but I didn't even know that that would ever be an option. But she, she seemed open to it. I think she was kind of waiting for somebody to pay attention to her because she's so amazing. So that's how it started. Um, that sounds really, uh, you know, all the stars aligning. It sounds like the, the documentary was just supposed to be made. So it's really interesting. Um, Gabriella, you know, continuing on this theme about you know, um, Diana's personality. One thing that stuck out to me in the film was you, your relationship with Diana and how you seem to be kind of polar opposites. You know, you seem very kind of light and, you know, just very, um, uh, you seem to be one of the people in the film that, that um, was unfazed by her, you know, and, I was just curious, you know, um, how do you, how do you do this? How do you get along with her so well? She seems to love you. Like I know lots oh, of people. I do. love her so <laughs> much. I cannot tell you how much I love Diana and admire her. And, and she is, you know, she is very threatening to many people, but I somehow, from many years ago, got onto her tiny, tiny, tiny soft spot. <laughs> because she, I mean, she is a complete sweetheart. And I know Elizabeth, I mean, boy, did you deal with her hard spots. Both sides, I've seen uh, both sides. Yeah. <laughs> no, but you, you really, I mean, you really, you really, you really, I, I saw parts, I, you know, I saw parts of the filming and I was like, oh my goodness, this is, disastrous because she can be very difficult but somehow I got onto like a good a good aspect of Diana or a good like I got onto her good side onto her good on you know onto her benevolent I think the first thing that happened is that she liked my food actually that's good <laughs> and and then she saw me with completely different eyes or she just saw me with those eyes. I mean, she, she wanted to meet me, which was extraordinary. And, and she, you know, she, she, I, I see a side of Diana, which is incredibly open and generous and kind and curious and hardworking and conscientious about things that she wants and does. And then I also see, of course, her more, you know, her more difficult side, but I just don't latch onto that. And I let her treat me however she wants. And then, and then she even apologizes sometimes. And she, you know, she asked, was I, was I really terrible to that person? I said, yes, you were. And I think, 
And as, as Elizabeth knows, I always tell her what I think. And I think she's surprised by that. Or I think she's, I think she enjoys that. I think it's the secret. Yeah. You just have Sorry, to be honest. Think. And I deeply admire her. I deeply, I, 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 you know, I really, I really appreciate everything that she does and has done. I, and I appreciate all this maniac way of living, you know, all this sort of very, this very, very conscientious to the degree of being neurotic way of living. Yeah. But I truly appreciate that. And I truly appreciate her sense of humor and the trust that she has in me. I, I, I feel completely blessed by it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, continuing again on this, <laughs> you, you talked, you mentioned about her way of living, which, you know, the film um, gives us these gorgeous visuals of her house in the middle of the mountains in Michoacan and her beautiful garden, which is um, Elizabeth's background right now. Um, mm -hmm. that's that's Diana. I know. I, I was going to say, that looks great. Um, and, but, you know, we, we, I think, you know, her sustainability, this, you know, she's been living in this eco-friendly house since the 70s before it was a thing. Um, and she's been doing it for so long. And Alice, I wanted to ask you, you know, how has she influenced you at all as far as sustainability? And can you talk a little bit about your, your relationship with Diana? Well, I feel very much the way Gabriella feels. I have such an admiration for her. I met her in um, the early 70s when, when her cookbook, and this cookbook out, in, and she came to Berkeley to sign books. And the friend who had the bookstore asked me if I would like to come and be part of a, a, a her cooking demonstration. And I said, yes, <laughs> and that's how we met. But she was very interested in the fact that I was a woman and running a restaurant. And I, I was naive and just doing it, um, without any restaurant experience. You know, in a way, the way that she went about writing her cookbooks and thinking about food, finding ingredients, traveling. I mean, I was in that place too. I, I definitely had a kind of French Mediterranean uh, perspective, but I, I didn't really know how to prepare food for those numbers and how to um, really find the ingredients because I wanted them to taste a certain way. And uh, her cookbook and her way of speaking about food had a huge, made a huge impression on me. And, uh, I went down to visit her in Mexico right after she um, uh, acquired that property and uh, um, was right at the beginning of that in the 80s. I don't know what year she began. She moved. Do you know, Gabriella? Oops, I can't hear you. Sorry, <laughs> in 75, yeah. I think. 75, she bought the property, maybe uh, thereabouts. Yep. Well, I probably was about 10 years into it, but I'll never forget being there. And mm. I, she took us on a tour of her compostable uh, toilet. Uh, we saw the way that her animals, you know, related to what she was growing. Uh, as she, um, had us have this beautiful lunch. She insisted that that we um, eat with her, and she had someone who sat by the table. And I'll never forget this, because she wanted the tortillas 
just to be completely hot and right. And somebody, her friend, made them right there and gave them to us at the plate. And that is the way that I think about eating a taco or having a tortilla. It's right off spot. And even, and you know, I make them for myself every morning with, with avocado if I can inside. And I'm just cooking it. And I think of Diane every time. But traveling with her and meeting restaurant women that uh, were in Oaxaca, I, I mean, it was an edible education for me about, about ingredients, where they come from, who grew them, how to be really true to the traditions of a place, how to experience in, in a big cultural experience. Wouldn't you say, David, I mean, that's, that's what really took me about her books, was not just the food. It was about the people, about the pots that they cooked in, the pictures that are in her book that show all the biodiversity of the place. There's, I mean, you just want to go there. <laughs> you know, it's like that. And you, you feel like you're in that, that, that culture, that, that very rich, amazing culture of Mexico. And we had no idea about it, or I certainly didn't before Diane came. Nothing, I had no idea. We are a country of tacos, and, you know. And Taco Bell. Taco Bell, yes. <laughs> so this, this was something really important. And she was so definitive about, about her liking something or not liking something. And, and never accepting a compromise. Maybe that's her gift to me. And it's my, <laughs> it's the thing that, that people struggle with, that, that I can't compromise about the ingredients or about the way something tastes. I can't hear you. You're muted. Okay. I'm muting myself. Um, David, turning to you. Um, so you mentioned that you've been friends with Diana for a really long time. And um, I just wanted to hear a little bit more also about your relationship with her. And you said that you went down to her, her house recently um, for the first time. And um, just curious, how, what was that like? And maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Uh, well, it's, it's funny because the trip that Alice was talking about when, when she first went to Diana's house, I was so jealous of all those people who went on that trip. <laughs> so, I have to tell you, and that was 30 years ago um, or so. Um, uh, uh, I always wanted to visit Diana at her house, uh, and I never had the chance to do there uh, to do it until just a few months ago. Uh, so it's really kind of interesting to watch the film and to see the house and to have having just uh, been there with Diana and all of that sort of thing. But I, I mean, I've known Diana for over the years uh, in many, many places. A lot of, a lot of it has been her visits to Chicanes, but uh, her books have really inspired me to travel throughout Mexico. I mean, I spent many, many, I mean, I, I used to go to Mexico uh, uh, an awful lot and I used to travel all around the country. I certainly didn't do it in the way Diana did. Um, but I traveled all around the country, uh, and I think she was a big inspiration. Uh, uh, she sort of inspired me to do that traveling, um, and to go to the markets, and to be in Oaxaca, and to be in the market, and uh, it, yeah, 
Um, the thing too about Diana is though that she really is, I mean, she's a stickler for, for uh, <laughs> I remember I wrote a recipe uh, uh, for the Times a few years ago and um, it was for a, uh, it was a, it was for a, a, a fish with Yucatan spices. And I, I, I offered the compromise of buying the little spice block, you know, <laughs> what? With with the with the achote and all the stuff that's mixed in that every every person uses, and she called me out on it. But <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I saw her in Ireland one day, uh, at one one at a food conference, and she said, "Well, you know, the recipe was great, but you should have made your own ricara. <laughs> you know, it's not that hard to do." Uh, and there she was, uh, stirring her pots and making sure that every taste, everything tasted exactly right. Uh, I mean, I mean, over the years, I have met her at lots and lots of food conferences. Uh, I've met her at, uh, uh, I've cooked for her uh, at Chez Panisse a number of times. Um, uh, and, well, David, were you, David, were you there the night she was coming and there was the earthquake. Yes. San Francisco. And she, we had the menu all planned and it was this beautifully designed and printed menu. And at about five o'clock, the, the big earthquake hit and she was in a plane still and it never landed in San Francisco. Mm. She had to, go on and you know, I, I think about how lucky it was that she did not land. And I think about that menu and I've always wanted her to come back so we could cook it for her. I, you know, I think actually when you went to Mexico on that trip, it was right after an earthquake in Mexico. Um, and so you were driving through Mexico, like through like the ruins of uh, uh, of tumble down buildings and whatnot. No, but there. I'm thinking about the earthquake in Mexico. Oh, I, I was thinking about the earthquake. Well, earthquake. So, yeah. Because I remember that that on that trip there was you and there was Tom and there was Deborah Madison and there was like all of these people. Yeah. And, I, and they were all going to visit Diana and I was staying home to mind the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I wanted to ask a question about legacy, um, just something we've we've all mentioned a little bit, but um, I wanted to hear maybe whoever wants to chime in, this is for anybody, um, but, you know, how is Diana's, outside of her cookbooks, um, you know, how is Diana, how is her work going to live on, um, and does she have a responsibility, you know, she's given so much to Mexico and to the world um, via her cookbooks, um, does she owe any more? Um, throwing that out there, whoever wants to answer. She's done so much. Um, I'll venture to just say, I think, I think her cookbooks pretty much summon, um, you know, her, her most important ideas, her most, you know, her, her biggest interests. But I think, for example, this film that Elizabeth uh, made is, is going to be important just to have people see a more personal aspect of Diana. And I think that's the most valuable part about this film. I think it's so endearing just in a way that that will, you know, make her remain uh, in, in different ways. And I think that her, just her speeches, and there's so much material of what she's been saying and doing, and there's, and all the work that she did with Cornavio, for example, about edible plants in Mexico. And for one that? of the parts, the work that she did? The Conavio. Conavio is this institute at the, in the biology department of the National University. And she, there's a whole compendium that they did with her, with her knowledge of Mexican edible, um, edible uh, plants and, and yeah, vegetable fruits, everything. She, they, they made a whole section and you can see it in the website of Conavio. And it's and it's it's a really important work. I mean, she 
you know, as she always says, I, I'm not an academic, but boy, has she worked as an academic in terms of, of the things that we will, that we now know thanks to her. And I just feel that, you know, and as Abigail Mendoza says in the film, which is one of the loveliest parts of the film, you know, that Diana is, has given to Mexico what not even, you know, no Mexican has given, actually. And, and to say that she was, even though she was not Mexican, she was Mexican. That, isn't that lovely? That was so beautiful. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, uh, well, as you will see if you haven't seen the film yet. But, yes. Um, and Elizabeth, you had mentioned... Question, the whole question of, you know, uh, cultural appropriation, you know, which is a hot topic, it's like, mm -hmm. this is a woman who uh, basically, uh, I mean, who would ever guess that some English woman would like latch on to, to Mexican cuisine and really want to know it uh, and to know it so well that you could then get, you know, from the government of Mexico, uh, uh, the award of the, what is it, the Eagle, the, um, uh, all of that. Um, I think though that you know, she's always talked about trying to keep the her house as a as a as a place a school as a place of learning. I, and in order for that to happen, someone has to be willing to fund it. You know, either that or there has to be a Diana Kennedy scholarship to some other uh, institute uh, in, institution of, uh, uh, of, of of culinary education. But there's so much there's so much richness there. Mm -hmm. um, and it would be really great if someone could carry on what she has there at the at the finca, but um, can it happen? Yeah, maybe somebody will be inspired after watching the film to potentially want to uh, to get involved. We do have um, some questions from from the audience that I wanted to get to. Um, so one person is asking, what are your favorite Diana Kennedy dishes? And for the chefs, I wonder if there's a specific quality of Mexican cooking and food that stands out to you as distinct from other cuisines. Um, what one thing truly distinguishes Mexican cooking? <laughs> Gabrielle, David, David, David should answer that because I'm too close to it. <laughs> so well, I, can, I can say that there's a reason that her first book was called The Cuisines of Mexico, mm -hmm. because there are so many different cuisines. I mean, I mean, there are so many regional cuisines all over Mexico, and everyone is a little bit different. You know, the food in Oaxaca is different from the food in Puebla. The food in Puebla is different from the food in Yucatan. The food in Yucatan is different from the food in the north. Uh, all of that sort of thing. And so... Uh, but there is still a kind of unifying aspect uh, uh, at all, I can say, from as a gringo. <laughs> but, but what would you say it is? Could I say passion? I don't know. Um, uh, I'm not hmm. certain. Um, I, I love to see, I mean, love, love, many of the recipes that I like from Diana are recipes for like refried beans and how to mm -hmm. do that, you know? Um, it's like uh, <laughs> from beans that you cooked in a pot, you know, with real lard and not, you know, from a can, uh, mm -hmm. certainly. Uh, no, certainly not from a can. <laughs> also, there's this, there, there, when Diana lived in New York, she, I remember one, one book that she wrote, she talked about uh, episote growing in, some neighborhood in New York. Yes, I, she, I, she loves that story. And I actually live in a neighborhood in New York where Episodic grows wild in the East Village. And I, every time I, I, I mean, I can walk a block from my house and I can <laughs> get wild Episodic that's growing up through the sidewalk and along, you know, all around it's like, uh, so uh, I love that. Uh, yep. I think of her all the time whenever I, <laughs> I, I keep trying to like, sort of transplant it into a little pot on my windowsill, you know. It seems like the last place in the world where episode two would grow wild, but I guess it just- Crazy, right? Crazy. 
Now, I just was trying to think of the, the recipe with pomegranates and walnuts. Mm. Is it pepper? With the, with the, with the pomegranate. Chiles and nogal. Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's a yep. very special recipe. It's a very, and Diana was very proud of making it because it takes many days. And she, and she always was very upset with foreigners who didn't get how sophisticated that dish yeah, was. Very complex dish. Very yes. complex dish. Yep. Because it's uh, Arab influence, like Middle East, Eastern <laughs> influence, and then yeah. all these, all these very lengthy processes of peeling the nuts and taking the skin out. And, you know, it's all these, and you only have these nuts for a time, certain time. So it's very, it's very, in Mexico, it's sort of a very um, seasonal and precious dish. Mm -hmm. Well, she was so interested in seasonality, of course, because she's yes. just obsessed about that. And um, again, it's, it's how, and where how the food is grown that is so valuable right now to her mm -hmm. legacy and to to be able to go and cook food learn to cook food at her house actually makes it with all of the ecological uh understanding is something of the future of of, of cooking schools and they're very I know. It's so yeah. relevant. Well, the fact that she actually has been doing those boot camps up until very, very recently, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it's like in the last few years, she still has been having people come for her, like, uh, you know, really boot camp. hard, hard ass. Boot camp. Uh, are you ready to cook? <laughs> it you is know? boot camp. You know, I, like, I did it. Uh, <laughs> uh, definitely, um, yeah, you. I might be crying. You might be crying in the bathroom. It wasn't me, but yeah, it might happen. Yeah. Uh, very, yeah. But it's amazing. I mean, it's one of a, I mean, a chance in a lifetime to be able to cook with her, you know. But also you go to her house and there, the first thing you see are, are, are the Seville oranges that she has growing there because she wants to make English marmalade. Totally. But right <laughs> all over the place, there are all these wild coffee plants growing yeah. everywhere because she wants to make coffee, you know, right from like the beginning <laughs> to, the end, to the end. Uh, mm -hmm. That was my experience when I went there to, to see her. Um, uh, <laughs> well, we didn't, uh, well, there wasn't any marmalade. She was like, I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't, I thought you were coming next week. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what, in, in any case, would you like to have some mezcal? We made it right here. <laughs> we had a little mezcal and she and I want you to have the taste of coffee. Let's make the coffee, right? Uh, and someone was, there was one of, one, uh, one of the staff was sitting on the steps, uh, taking the little skins off the coffee beans so that, you know, you can move along with that process. And uh, that was, uh, in those, those few hours that we had sitting at the table and chatting, uh, uh, drinking coffee and drinking mezcal. Wow. <laughs> uh, it was really, really moving uh, and yep. sort of central. Uh, She's very precious about her own coffee. Yeah. Very. You know, Gabrielle, that she travels with it. She takes an allotted amount with her whenever she's traveling somewhere and she will drink that for herself in the morning and would never share it because she can't. Uh -huh because she only has enough for herself for the trip. And that's just, everyone should understand that. It's not personal, it's just coffee, it's important. <laughs> um, I have another question from a reader or a listener or watcher. Um, this person says, I'm originally from Mexico City and from my childhood, I remember seeing her work everywhere. As a scholar of cultural studies, I've written about her. I wonder if Gabriela and Leslie could comment their view regarding us Mexicans ourselves appreciating our own cuisine. And I kind of had this thought too when I was watching the film, which was, you know, um, like, why did it take a British woman to come in and the, the film sort of briefly mentions this, but why did it take a British woman to come in and start documenting the cuisine? I mean, right now we have, you know, work from a lot of different scholars, obviously, about Mexican cooking. Ricardo Muñoz Zurita has this beautiful, 
you know, huge Mexican food gastronomic dictionary. Um, but I was curious, Gabriela, on your, your opinion on that. I think, I, I mean, I've always thought, and I, I've discussed this with Diana endlessly. You know, we, we have been used to eating so well that we take it for granted. And I think um, in Mexico up to very recently, we had these, you know, we traditionally had these women who would keep these, these recipes going for generations and generations. And of course they would be modified depending on what was available or not. But people have been very proud of their food on one end, but on the other hand, sort of assuming that it's just there. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, this lady in 1957 arrived in Mexico and was completely mind blown because she's curious and observant and oddly enough, very empathetic. And, and when she decides she's gonna pay attention to something, she does it so meticulously. And she was fascinated by this because she had the view of an outsider. She hadn't been, you know, she hadn't been raised with refried beans. Mm -hmm. And I, I really feel that in Mexico, I, I, for example, and this is, I don't want to go off, you know, drift away, but for example, in Peru, Gaston Acurio and Peruvian chefs have done such a great job at sort of being proud of their cuisine in a way that in Mexico, nobody has taken on other than Diana, because we just, assume it's there like there's there's so much and it's so bountiful and it's so you know there's so much richness that we sort of just say oh yes my own you know my aunt does it this way this other aunt does it this other way and I've gone to this place and they do it this other way and it's sort of like it's so it, you know the proximity is such that you don't have that perspective that she did that's 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 something that I I find that was very um, very fortunate for her. I also, I grew up with a foreign mother and I feel that that for me also has been something that has made it easier somehow to appreciate, you know, the complexity of, my, of, the, of, of, of different cultures. Somehow when you grow and when you're so, um, I don't know, I just feel in Mexico, there's this sort of there's this, there's this aloofness about food or just this taking for granted, I say, you know, and there isn't this academic rigor that Diana did have when she was looking for her recipes. And she, and she was always, she's always been very, very, and she, it, you know, it even comes out in the film. She's always been very, very careful with who to credit about the recipe, you know, for the recipe. And something that she hates about Mexican scholars as she, you know, sort of, looks down on them is that they don't they don't attribute the recipes to to the right people so if they are like this is my recipe for salsa verde and it's like you know what actually they've been making this salsa verde in such and such a town of puebla for the past mm. i don't know how many hundreds of years so i just think it was a combination of her her really being interested in the foods and the flavors and the origins of ingredients and also her rigor her really taking it very seriously. Do you think that she is, inspi do you think that she has inspired uh, the uh, younger Mexican chefs to uh, take more responsibility for understanding their culture? You know, I think maybe more recently, yes, but not for a very long time. Yes. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, I, it made me about Julia Child uh, yeah. being in, bringing French food to to the United States and and how her just immersion in that um, captured the attention of the whole country uh, mm -hmm. in a way. Um, I mean, certainly we all watched her shows on, on television, but the one, the one piece that, that um, she couldn't quite grasp at, at her time of cooking was the shift from sort of real food to fast food, to, to, to industrial production of food. 
she didn't want to think that that was happening in the United mm -hmm. States. And it has happened all around the world, certainly in Mexico and the, the loss of the corn varietals, all of the things that are going on. And people think that they're cooking traditional dishes, when in fact, it's, it's not the same. And that is something bringing Diana forth at this moment with Kim is, I think, incredibly valuable to all of us uh, to be reminded of, of the seasonality and the purity and, and, and of course, the, the, the effects on climate and- the Ecological and, impact, yeah. It's really, really important right now. I think probably Julia Child, if she had stayed around, she would have come around because she was so interested in taste and, and the particulars of the recipe, like Diana. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Gabriela, you were gonna say something. No, I was just, I was, I mean, I'm just, I'm just, I was, I've always been fascinated by how, how avant-garde Diana has been, always. I also, I also grew up in a household that was very similar to Diana's in Tepoztlan because my parents were very ahead of their time. And I feel this is another connection between Diana and myself, but I truly, I mean, it is so important. And at this time, I mean, with this crisis that we're living, just like the, the awareness of, of, of the consequences of what one eats and how one prepares it, and just the the just you know what what Alice was saying to actually live with this ecological conscience. Mm -hmm. Diana is so strict about it, and so many people have made fun of her, but actually, she is so right. Yes, and Elizabeth, can you um, can you talk just a little bit more because the mo the film I think. Um, didn't, I mean, I know you had a lot to get into and I think there's, can you share a little bit more details about what her house is actually like as far as the sustainability practices and the things that she, you know, the whole system that she has set up there, which isn't just, you know, oh, she has solar panels on the roof or something like that. Like this is, this is a lot deeper than that. Can you talk a little bit more about that? <laughs> sure, yeah. I mean, all of the three of you have also been to her house, so you can chime in anytime. Gabrielle, you've been a lot too. Um, so, I mean, it's, a, it's just a, it's a top down, it's the entire thing is completely sustainable. She doesn't waste anything. She uses barely any electricity. She only has electricity for basically like an emergency situation and for her computer, you know, which she does use. But, um, yeah, I mean, she just, she's so incredibly integrated with her land mm -hmm. and what she's growing and and it's as if she's just a participant in that cycle is is kind of what it feels like when you're there and she's talking about how she you know takes not only her own compost but her neighbor's compost to put on her plants and on her you know garden plots and her orchards to grow everything because why would you waste that stuff if they're just going to throw it away that makes good soil you know and um, she uses barely any water. You can't wash your hands with running water. She would absolutely lose her mind. You have to use the allotted, albeit dirty, like ish, uh, little plastic <laughs> thing full of water in the sink, but that's, it's out of respect for being there, you know, and, and that's something that she gives you when you first get there. She's like, all right, these are the rules. You can't, you, you're, you're in my house and you will not deter in your, Americanized way and do your American things because that's not what we do here, you know, and so she'll and so it was something to adjust to initially, you know, mm -hmm. the outhouse if we're there for 15 hours that was, you know, interesting but and great and really, really efficient and um, so yeah, she doesn't waste a thing. But Gabriella can say more. No, no. I mean, there's all, all sorts of stories that just come to my mind and make me smile because I've heard, you know, it, she's very thorough about everything that she thinks and does. And there's no compromise. And that's really the way she's chosen to live. And it's very, it's extraordinary. Yeah, she practices what she preaches. That's for yep. sure. Yep. Yep. 
Um, on this, this, this idea of no compromise, you know, um, uh, she talks in the film a couple of times, she mentions, don't, don't put garlic in guacamole, you know, guacamole <laughs> should never have garlic. Um, and, you know, I've read a lot about her and she makes lots of comments like this in, in articles, you know, every time somebody writes a story about her. And I was curious if you, you know, um, David or, or Alice or Gabriella, if you had any thoughts about this idea of rules within a cuisine, you know, um, and, and rules within a cuisine, should they always be followed? You know, do you have to follow the rules in order to get the best results? Are you, is it okay? Are we allowed to experiment? You know, Diana's listening. So like, but yeah, what do you think? Well, I, I have a strong opinion about it. Is that you? You need to follow the rules at the beginning. But if you can make it better, you can make it any way you want. That, that, that there's something about your, the practice of learning how to make something in a very traditional way. And I certainly have great respect for that. And once you do that over and over again, if you can, you know, embroider on that and make it better than the, or, and the Diana would agree that it's <laughs> uh, more tasty, uh, then yes, yes. And I think uh, we do that all the time at Chez Paris. We think about food that way. Do it the way that we've done it, unless you want to put forth a better way. And if you don't, so well, then you do it this way. I'm a, a, maybe, David, you can speak to this. Well, it, it's, yeah. it's complicated because you have a lot of young yeah. So young, <laughs> uh, you have a lot of uh, uh, the new generation of chefs wants to be able to uh, express them, uh, express a certain uh, feeling. And uh, does that mean you toss everything away? I mean, it's like, I don't know. In Oaxaca, there is a way to make uh, a certain kind of dish and you make it because your mother showed you how to do it and your aunt did it that way. And you're going to teach your daughters how to do it that way because that's the way you make it. Uh, and do you need some? Uh, sorry, uh, uh, do you, I mean, do you need some? Uh, uh, you don't necessarily need some uh, snotty little fellow who thought he went to cooking school uh, to make a new idea, you know, to make a new version of it just because you can. I don't know, it's, uh, it, it's complicated. Uh, uh, I mean, you ha actually, it's interesting though that you can get in a lot of places in the US now, I mean, in, 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 you can get better, ta better tortillas uh, in, in Brooklyn than you can in some towns in, in, in Mexico where they're using the powdered, uh, you know, uh, uh, maiseca from the, you know, from the sack. Uh, so it, it, things are strange in a, in a certain kind of way. But I never think, whenever I'm in Mexico, I never think that people would rather be eating at McDonald's. You know, wouldn't they? I, I mean, they know what's good to eat, right? I mean, I, I love to see like the little places where they set up lunches for workers and um, uh, it's all real food, you know? Huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Gabriella. I mean, it's 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 quickly going, you know, down the wrong way because because industrialization of food has been terrible, and it's been you know in Mexico the past forty years have made food be really bad for most Mexicans, and now with COVID, you know, mo most of the people who are dying are people who have other ailments you know, ailments that have to do with that, with, with eating the wrong things and, yeah. and being obese and being, you know, having cardiovascular um, diseases that come from eating 
really bad food. Yeah. So you have, you know, you, the past 40 years have really changed the way we live in Mexico. And, you know, the migration to cities, migration to the United States, um, the lack of, of, of prosperity in the countryside. And, and you have, of course, the small examples and the people who have been able to cultivate their own corn and beans and chiles and keep on eating traditionally. But then you have these masses of people who live on the outskirts of Mexico City in the most horrible mm. pieces of, you know, very desertic land that nobody would want to live in other than because they really need to get out of where they are. So, I mean, I just, you know, this is one extreme. And then going to Diana and Alice, what you were saying about rules, I really feel that there are rules that one should stick to when cooking. Absolutely. Throwing away food, why? No. And, and, and traditions and recipes, you know, recipes have always been like this, you know, walking this fine line between tradition and finding new ways and, and doing it, making it better, improving it, as you were saying, Alice. And I, I do feel that, you know, I don't know. I always definitely me. I always have a, you know, like what would Diana do? Sort of. <laughs> I say the same thing. I even have a chapter about that yeah. in my book. Yeah. <laughs> um, because 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 it's 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 a reality of mine. And Diana, I mean Diana thinks so many of the things I've done are not good. For example, at Gala in in San Francisco, she thought it was atrocious that I had food that you could eat with your hands because for her, you know, a restaurant is not a place where you eat with your hands. That's sort of like an hors d'oeuvres or taco stand on the street. You know, you don't you do not eat with you do not have a torta ahogada in a formal restaurant. That was for her, very troubling, for example. So like certain rules I, 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 I take distance from, but other rules, you know, rules that make for a better world and hence make sense, of course I think one should follow. And, and, and things, you know, there are rules in cooking. Even the most modern cooks that we enjoy eating from have, have very clear rules about what to do with, with you know, with, or like Samin's classic salt, fat, acid, heat. If you have, you know, if you, if you follow certain rules with these four elements, you're, that's following rules. That's being classic in a way. You know, I think, I think any good cook has their very basic rules. Would you say, that, David? The food that you do at Contramar is basically traditional, very traditional, but there's something revolutionary about it as well. You know, I mean, it has... Yeah. It has, I mean, I mean it, the food there pops, you know, it like, it feels contemporary, but the, but the basic, but the basic uh, ingredients are very traditional and you're not, you're not yes. trying to reinvent the wheel. You're trying, uh, you're trying to honor, uh, what would you say? Well, good ingredients, yeah. good combinations, it, 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 combinations that work. I mean, but for example, the tuna tostada, that's something that didn't exist in the world before Contramar. And that's something that Diana immediately approved of, for example. Uh -huh. It's something that, you know, it's simple enough that it works. Yeah. And okay. it has all the elements of, it's just, it's not pretentious, but it is different, but it isn't, you know, but it's just, it's just good. Yeah. So good. If I might say you so myself. <laughs> you can't. You can't. <laughs> I, want, I would do anything to go to Contramar right now. <laughs> Um, so I, I mean, yeah, so would, so would everybody. So just for your peace of mind, <laughs> it's not open. <laughs> um, quite a few people are asking about the future of the house um, and what's going to happen to Diana's house. And um, I think we, we sort of mentioned like David, I think you had said if we, there's somebody, they, she could turn it into a sender, get some funding, but um, you know, What's going to happen to her house? Um, does anybody have any, any thoughts or? I mean, there are so many, there's so many, there, there have been many plans and she herself has gone through different plans for her own house. But I do believe that until she lives there, it can't be a center for people to just like pop in and come and visit. It can't be a cooking school. It can, you know, we have a foundation and we've had this discussion for years now with groups of friends with, of Diana that, that, that want her legacy to, you know, to continue. So I, 
and I don't know. And also, Sitakwaro now is in a is in a is in a different is in a diff very different situation than 20 years ago because the safety of that part of the world is not ideal, just in terms of traveling and and even if it is close enough to Mexico City, I don't know. I I do believe there will be something done there in terms of like cultural patrimony, but she one day is just ready to get up and leave and just get out of there. And then another day she's very sort of committed to the, to the place. So I don't know. I think we'll see. Yeah. I think we'll, yeah. Well, I think we, um, we have time just for final thoughts. Um, if anybody wants to share just any thoughts about Diana, um, memories, anecdotes or anything, um, we have about five minutes before, the end of the discussion. Well, I have a, a bouquet of flowers that I want to give you, Diana, if you're watching. But I know when I'm looking at this, uh, these are flowers that I was given from the Edible Schoolyard here in Berkeley, the project at the school. And I know that she would know the names of every one of these flowers in this bouquet and all the herbs as well. I mean, that's, that's the kind of appreciation she has for just the ingredients uh, in all realms, <laughs> I would say, not just in terms of edible, but she has such a knowledge uh, and uh, for the biodiversity of the place and I'm, I'm just grateful for that, for that, uh, um, that edible education she's given me. Anyone else? David? I'm thinking about, uh, you know, she has the book Nothing Fancy which is a mixture of all kinds of things. Uh, and, you know, it's Mexican uh, things, but it's British things, and it's like scones here and something else there. Uh, but she had one little dish that she made. Well, there was a carrot. People have copied this forever now. There was a carrot and coriander soup. It was basically a, a, a carrot puree in a French style, but with very yeah. spicy with cilantro and onions and chilies. And it was really, really delicious and kind of revolutionary for the moment. And she didn't claim it as, a, you know, as Mexican or anything else, but it was something that she made from her own sort of uh, aesthetic. And there was a dish of, uh, of pasta where she made whole wheat, uh, hand cut whole wheat pasta with corn wow. and creme fraiche uh, and uh, red onions and, and chilies. And I used to always put that on the menu at, at uh, uh, in the cafe at Chez Panisse. Um, mm -hmm. It was like well, so it was like brilliant, you know. It was brilliant. It was like uh, you could you could approach it from any uh, vantage somehow. If you knew about Mexican uh, uh, cooking, oh, so much the better. But even if you didn't, it was it was a, a delicious combination of things. So. Uh, her, her, her food knowledge and her food sensibility has um, uh, a lot of breadth, I would say. Elizabeth, any, any final thoughts? Oh, wow. Um, well, it's just, this is an honor and it's a really special thing that Diana was able to bring this group together to talk about her and um, I just want people to know um, who are watching that we're going to be doing something that's almost similar to this five minute, you know, messages for Diana send off or final thoughts idea um, next month. And we're going to basically ch choose a day that we're calling Diana Kennedy Day, um, where anybody, home cooks, chefs, whomever, journalists, anyone who's interested in, in Diana and her work and the film, um, can basically send a little message to Diana. So um, we're gonna basically compile all of these video messages um, and then show them to her so that she can enjoy them. Um, so just 
keep in mind for that um, in terms of the general plug. I think that's my job at this point. Um, the film is available to watch. Uh, you go to dianakennedymovie.com and you can geotrack um, how to find it through an independent cinema. We're working with 150 cinemas around the US. Um, it's not available to stream yet in Mexico and a lot of people have been trying to and asking for that. We don't have distribution in Mexico yet. Um, so we're actively pursuing that and looking for that. And I, I'm very hopeful that it can be streaming in Mexico soon because I think it's really important and a lot of people want to see it. Um, so thank you for everybody who's interested in that. And um, thanks to everybody who's uh, gone and watched the film already. And the reception has been really good. So I'm really excited. And thank you all for being part of this. This is like a dream come true for me to have you guys all here. So thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, David and Alice and Gabriella, um, for sharing all of your insight and your, your memories and, and your knowledge. Um, this has been super interesting and I feel really honored to have been a part of this. So thank you. Thank you, Lindley. And if you have other questions, you can, um, you know, we can try, to, I'll try to answer a lot of them here um, after the fact. And then um, if you have other questions, feel free to, you know, email, send something, send a note, you know, on the film's website, um, find us on Instagram, do whatever you want to do. But I'm always here to answer questions if you ever want. So anyway, thanks, thanks so much, you guys. Thank you for being part of this. Thanks, everyone. Thank okay, you. Good night. Thank you so much, guys.